abstract our understanding about everything and anything he possibly can. I mean, even if you profess to be a Christian, I guarantee you the enemy is going to come after you. You might be a pretend, want to be practicing, you know, Christian, going to church, going through the motions. I guarantee you, you're wondering why your life is winding up in chaos because the enemy knows his time is numbered and he's coming after you. Even a pretend Christian is a threat to the enemy, right? I mean, if you got everything going for you and uh, you know what, your, your wealth is astounding and abounding and you need to, you need to check yourself. Right? You're either, you're either running really close with God or the devil's got you right where he wants you. Amen? All right. Let's pray. Grab your Bibles. It's time for victory. Father God, we give you all glory and praise in this day. We give you victory over it, Father God. The situations in our life, the circumstances that we're going through, Father God, are nothing compared, nothing compared to what has happened in the past to our forefathers and foremothers. Father God, we ask that you would be with us, blessing us in health and prosperity, and Father God, in understanding. Father God, that you would bless us in our lives, in our families. Father God, that our growth in our spiritual faith would be as strong, Father God, as you desire it to be, Father. And that our physical, physicalness, Father God, would represent that of a true true Christian. Father God, we give you all glory and praise over this time, over this message, over this day. And Father, over every person that's listening or watching or hearing, Father God, we bless them, Lord. We ask blessings over them, Father God. And we ask right now, Lord, that you would intervene in our time. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Do you feel alone? This is the question I asked our men's breakfast group yesterday morning. So let's lean into this. Do you feel like everyone is just going through life at their own pace and you have been left behind? Come on, church, it's a question to you. Do you feel that way? Sometimes we do feel that way, don't we? You know, how about maybe you really are alone? I'm alone, but I'm not alone. Amen. Right? Right? Oh, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. All right? Maybe you're single. Okay? There's a couple of people that are in our church that are single. Maybe you have very little family to depend on. Maybe you just don't click with your coworkers or your classmates. Now, many of us have reminisced about the good old days when we were in high school and we had at least two or three good friends, really good friends that we ran with, hung out with, did stupid stuff with. Man, I could tell you some stupid stories about some of the things I did, but we, we ain't got all day. Okay? That, that's a whole nother book series that I'm, I'll be working on. But we, we want and we long for that kind of companionship, that kind of relationship with somebody. But over time, over time, if you recognize, your circle of influence has slowly dwindled. It's, it's shrunk, right? And, and it's become less of a priority in our life to make those connections, to make sure that we have those type of people in our life. And we've become swamped. We've become overwhelmed with what is going on in our lives. It's either we're overwhelmed with what's happening in our household, in our families, or we're overwhelmed with what's going on in our work life. Come on, all you workaholics, right? I know. I'm raising my hand because <laughs> I'm Reggie and I'm a workaholic. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning how to say no, but it's hard. It's really hard. It is. If your parents, if your if your parents, you know the feeling all too well of not being able to leave your kids with anybody or, you know, that person that you just trust, you know. And my wife has a hard time, you know, when, when our kids were growing up to just leave them with a the babysitter. She always wanted to call and check in 
you know, or let's just drive by. No, we're out on a date. We ain't driving by. If we're going to drive by the house, we're going home. You know, what's the point? Right? Right. You know, we get so caught up in what's going on around us that we, we really forget what we should be doing. Okay? We were created for community. You believe that? You know, I mean, they say it, what, it takes a village to raise a child, right? It, it, takes a, it takes a community to raise an adult. It does. You know, I mean, I know many of adults out there that wouldn't be where they are if it wasn't for the people in their community. And, you know, it ain't just about their parents. It's about people that actually give a doggone in their community. Right? It's people who care about that person. And they don't want to see that person continue to fail in life. And so what does the community do? They pour in to these people. I think we're lacking a lot of that in our community stance. In our community lives. We don't see that much anymore, do we? People have, people have withdrawn from be an exterior and starting to be interior. They're starting to be exclusive, not exclusive. Right? We were created for fellowship with each other. I'm the type of person that you're only a stranger for a, a certain amount of time. Okay? Once I get to talking with you, once I get to know you just a little bit, I mean, it only takes me a little bit, you know, because, you know, and, and I did this well before I was a pastor. I always asked pointed questions, you know, because I wanted to know a little bit about the person. I, you know, I was doing that, that self-check, right? Checking those things off my list, making sure that this person was okay to even be hanging out with or be around at this moment. You know, and you could, you could tell by the way that people talk. By the way that people communicate, by the way that people respond to, to certain questions, whether or not they are an introvert or an extrovert, right? Whether they're the type of person that just says, you know what, I'm very facial, just say hi to me and keep going. Or they're very communicative and they believe in talking with people and getting to know people. You could tell that just in a few seconds if you're paying attention to the way that people respond. I want to tell you about a man in the Bible. He was considered the wisest man in the world at that time. His name was Solomon. He faced the same issues we face today. Oh, he had all the wealth. He had the nice house. He had the extravagant hobbies. He had all the beautiful spouses, right? Yeah. I mean, this man could toss a party like no other. He was a true baller, right? But through all of this, Solomon, the wisest man in the world at that time, was lonely. He was frustrated. He struggled desperately. And no one around him knew it. See, we're really good about putting on a facade. We're really good about letting people see just what they need to see so they get a glimpse of something we're not. I mean, all of us should you know, be earning an Oscar for the play that we play, for the part that we play, right? Because we could be really fake. We could, we, could, we could tell a good lie by physical appearance. What's the old saying? If you put a suit on a pig, it's still a pig, right? If, if you're depressed and messed up, if you're, you know, tore up from the floor up, it doesn't matter the suit that you wear. It doesn't matter the, the shoes or the clothes that you have on. It doesn't matter the way that your nails look or your hair looks or how much lipstick you have on your face. 
You know, it doesn't matter about all those things. You're still tore up from the floor up. You're still messed up. You're still longing for that relationship or something in your life that's going to change you, that's going to help you, that's going to make your confidence soar. Because when we're confident, when we're confident in our spirit, we're confident in our life. Amen? Do you believe that? Listen to the words he writes. If one person falls down, is there anyone there to pick him up? Solomon was depressed. And he was desperate. Desperation leads to depression. Depression leads to loneliness. And loneliness leads to death. Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes 4, 8 through 12. Ecclesiastes 4, 8 through 12. It says... And I saw all that labor, all achievement spring. Okay. And I saw that all labor and all achievement spring from man's envy of his neighbor. Am I reading the right one? Oh, I'm reading number four. Let me skip down to 12. Uh, no, number eight. There was a man alone and he had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and whom am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This, too, is meaningless and miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But who, how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. No matter what you say, no matter how you think about it, people just like to be around people. Now, I've heard stories about, you know, and, and there's actually a couple of TV shows about the wilderness men. You know, these guys who have cut away from society and they want to go live in the wilderness all alone because they are so sick of being around people, right? I mean, there are times in my life I'm like, you know, I would like to be people-less, you know, you see those things on, on uh, like YouTube or Facebook. It says, if you were paid such, such amount of millions of dollars, would you give up all the Internet, all the luxuries of life, you know, just to go live in this beautiful cabin fully stocked for the rest of your life? I was like, I'm there. I could do that. You know, especially that one that's right by a near, nice little stream or a lake. You know, I could be happy. I'd be happy out there. But I think I would only be happy for a time because I'm a very personable person. I, I like people. You know, you can only talk to a tree for so long and, you know, it's just going to stand there and it's just going to bark at you. Anyway, that was a bad joke. Yep, I know. I know. It branches out. Anyway. Um, that's why, that's why Grizz, Grizzly Adams the there's, there's, there's a million of them. Grizzly Adams. I remember Grizzly Adams. Yeah. But he talked to the animals. You know, he had, he had a friendship with a bear. That'd be cool, man, to have a, you know, big 800-pound grizzly bear standing behind me everywhere I went. All right. People just like to be around other people. There's a lot of reasons other than these that uh, we've mentioned that people want to be around other people or want to disconnect. One such reason is that it's just easier to get certain jobs done when you have more people, Right? I mean, have you ever seen these big skyscrapers? They don't just, you know, one guy is not out there building that on his own. Right? Right. Can you imagine the pyramids? If one guy was the only one out there building it, they'd still be doing it today, and he wouldn't even be halfway done. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, this is it. Done. All right. Right. Certain jobs take a certain amount of people. All right, let's, 
I, I want to I wanna put pastors on the spot, okay? I want to talk about evangelism, for instance. All right? I, I know it looks easy by what you see on TV, right? I mean, these wealthy churches, you know, they're going out in troves, and they're talking to people on the street, you know, and they make it look really easy. Well, they don't show you the ugly side of it. They don't show you the people spitting and cussing and throwing things at them. They only show you the people that they've actually talked to about giving their life to Christ. You know, I, I love watching uh, Kirk Cameron and... Uh, I, what? Yeah, well, it's the way of the master. And I love watching these two guys because they actually do show the ugly side of it. You know, they're, they're walking down the beachfronts and they'll confront people or ask them pointed questions, you know, and you'll, you'll hear people tell them, you just need to blank off, right? You just need to back away from me. I'm not interested in that. And then they're like, oh, okay, well, move on to the next person, you know? It's not so easy. I mean, it would always be better if two or more people got together instead of one, Right? I mean, it's easier for a pastor to have somebody come alongside them, like maybe a uh, associate pastor or a youth pastor, you know, or somebody that would be there to be with that person to be able to say, you know what? I got your back. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to encourage you. Annihilated. Exactly. Exactly. When we try to do things alone, we're going to get into that. We're going to get into the planning part of that, all right? We're going to talk about these things. When I was a young boy, for instance, I was young once. And, yeah, I know. I know. And to earn money, I, I worked for a lot of, you know, farmers and throwing hay bales. Now, you got to imagine 40 to 80 pound hay bales. You know, for a young skinny guy, he's going to get he's going to get pretty strong, you know, over the season. Well, it, it takes a group of people to get this job done. I mean, the fields in Oklahoma, you know, there would be like 5000 bales of hay. And you got a certain amount of time before the rain comes to get these bales of hay up and get them in the barn. So it would take an army of guys out there. One driving the vehicle, two to three or four guys on the trailer, you know, four, five, six guys on the ground. I mean, you're pitching bales of hay, you're loading those trailers up, and then they're driving off. And while they're driving off, the next empty trailer's pulling up. So it was go time. It wasn't stop. It was just go, 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 sun up, sun down, sun up, sun down, until the job was completed. And it took a lot of us to get it done. I remember watching my uh, brother-in-law one time. He was out, and we had a very small field at our house in uh, Oklahoma, and he had to take care of that field. And one time he was out there by himself. He had the tractor going in a straight line, and he had the trailer, and he was out there pitching bales of hay onto that trailer, you know, and stacking them from the ground, you know, where he could, as high as he could get, you know, and he was doing that all by himself. And it took him all week to do it by himself it's crazy how much more would it have been easier you know if i would have had the time i would have went out there but you know my sister had me locked up doing other things you know i mean i had to take care of the animals well no not necessarily on the farm no it was uh it was everybody was helping out with everything you know everybody had their specific jobs so we did things well, it was fun, but it was hard work, and it was hot work, <laughs> you know. I can't imagine doing it by myself. I, I can't imagine anybody going out there and doing these hard jobs by their self. It is a lot of work. It is. Yeah, it was always easier to have somebody to help take that care of. Right. Right, right. It, it's just too tough to go it alone. It's too daunting. It's too hard, right? 
I mean, you need somebody with like-mindedness to go right beside you. you. You definitely don't want somebody on the opposite end of the spectrum from where you're thinking to go with you. You know, because then you're not just battling the people that you're up against. You're battling this person that is supposed to be helping you. And then you're defeated before you get started. Two are definitely better than one. We have only a couple of things to look at in this message. Two are better than one, and they are a good reward for their labor, a good hand to lend in a fall, a good reward for their labor. Anything that we put our hand to, we undoubtedly want to have a good return on it, don't we? Right? Come on, church. Whatever the action is, we want to gain from the experience. And that, of course, I hope, I hope, is a godly gain. Amen? Amen. For this action, for this section, we've broken it down even further into different areas that can benefit, we can benefit by having a good friend or spouse within our life. A good friend or a spouse, of course, that God has provided. Amen? I mean, before you became a Christian and you had a good friend, you know, you guys did things. But, you know, you can recount some of the stupid things that you guys probably got into. Trouble. Right? And now that, now that you're a Christian, you kind of want to do things according to how God's will would be. I, I would hope so, right? So let's talk about ministry. It, it, it just stands to reason that people in ministry need all the help they can get. Amen? Amen. I mean, we've often told you guys that we can't do this alone. We can't do it without you. You know, that would just be me up here talking to the chairs, right? Talking to the air. Well, why is that? Well, Jesus himself told us in Matthew 9, 37. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 9, 37. In Matthew 9, 37, Jesus said these words. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You can ask any pastor, any seasoned church worker, and they'll tell you that 80% of the people do 20% of the work. While 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Now, of course, that will fluctuate from the church size or the ministry to ministry. But it comes pretty close across the average. As God's servants, we do want a good reward for our labor. And how better to approach a ministry than to approach it with a friend. Amen? Don't go it alone. A good friend to help you during evangelism will certainly increase not only your ministry validity, but help boost your confidence as well. I mean, if I'm going into battle as a military person, I want the person next to me to have the same knowledge, the same plan that I have, that I know, so that way if I start questioning what's next, they'll say we were doing this next. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what we were doing. And we make sure that the plan is successful. That's in anything that we do in life. Anything that we do in life, we want to make sure that we have knowledge and that the person that is doing it with us has that same knowledge. Amen. Like-mindedness, yes. True friends will be like-minded in ministry. And God has brought you together to go forward together in his ministry. Let's talk about planning. Proverbs 2018, Proverbs 2018, turn your Bibles there. Proverbs 2018, it says, plans are established by seeking advice. 
So if you wage war, obtain guidance. Now we can change that just a little bit. I'm not, you know, adding or subtracting from the Bible. Please don't throw stones at me. Okay. But I'm just saying, if we put this into our circumstance, all right, if, if you are going into ministry, if you're going into business, if you're about to get married, if you're going into a relationship, whether it be with your future spouse or with someone that you desire to make your best friend, you want to obtain guidance. Amen? I mean, who better to tell us how to be a better friend than God? He's friend to all. We're the ones that reject him. He's never rejected us. Amen? <laughs> if you've been the boss or a manager, you know, you know how difficult it is to put schedules together on your own. It, it's, it's only inviting disaster in any project or any goal that you may have in mind. You know, you need to make sure, you know, like if you're the boss of a company or you're the manager of a company, you want to make sure you're talking to your people. You want, you want to know their heart, right? I mean, not everybody can have Sunday off, right? I mean, if you're a business that's open during Sunday, not everybody can have Sunday off. You know, find those people that really don't care whether they work on Sunday or not. You know, it's, it's a give or take. But it's knowing your people's heart. Having a true Christian friend to bounce ideas off of and help you in planning can only lead to a great spiritual success. And, and that's what God desires. You know, in the Bible, it says that iron sharpens iron. We want to make sure that we are doing that. You know, it's about us, you know, rubbing our ideals against each other and saying, you know what? What's the best for God's kingdom? What, you know, we got, we got this ideal over here that we want to save lives, that we want to change hearts, that we want to change the direction of people and the way that they're going. How's the best way that we can approach that? It's not about going and beating them over the head with the Bible. Right? I mean, I don't think, I don't, I've never read in the Bible where, you know, anybody has done that. You know, I, I don't, you know, you don't walk around with your, you know, your scripture stick and whacking people. Right? I, I mean, it might be fun. I, I did it for a little bit. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, right, right, right. Results may vary, right? <laughs> you can fail when you and your good friend in Christ get together in the spirit and you can't fail. Sorry. You can't fail when you and your good friend in the spirit in Christ get together and start planning. Amen. So God says when, when you are in, in a good friend are together and you're making plans, what does God say? God says, go for it. He says, I've opened up the door. I've, I've made the way for you. Go for it. Because I know you're going to be successful. Turn your Bibles to Proverbs eleven fourteen. 14. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Proverbs eleven fourteen. It says, for lack of guidance, a nation falls. It fails. But victory is won through many advisors. We all know that our nation began as a Christian nation. Right? Now, many of our founding fathers, they might have done things or said things or lived a certain way. But they all had advisors they had advisors that were talking to them about specific ideas that they might have had and 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 they prayed <laughs> right i mean they didn't they didn't just go in and say all right god here we go you know we need you to be with us no they prayed our founding fathers they prayed 
They fasted. They, they sought higher counsel. And our nation was a Christian nation. We didn't always do things right. Right? Why is that? Because we're human. Right? We can't hold that against them. We can't hold the things that, you know, our forefathers had done in the past against the people of today. You know, as a Native American, I can't hold y'all responsible for, you know, my land being taken. It's not my land in the beginning. It's God's. Right? It's not mine. I don't own anything. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That means he owns it all. It ain't ours to be given or taken away. <laughs> I don't understand reparations. Anyway, we're not going to get into that. Decision making like planning can be easier when there are others to help you reach a critical decision. Right? It's like, you know, when... when me and Rose and Tina and John had to get together during a board meeting and, and we're talking about things that we're wanting to get done here at the church. You know, we, we, have to, we have to talk about the issues and the situations and then we come to a conclusion and then we vote on that conclusion and we say this is what we really want to do. You know, and if it's, if it's altering something here at the church, well, what do we do? We don't just stop there. We bring it to the congregation. Right. We want to make sure that all the body of Christ is on board, right? It's not just about us making a decision and saying that's the way it's going to be. That's not how things work, right? Our nation could really take a, a look at the way a lot of churches do things. If, if, it's, if it's pastor, board, body ran, it's a great program, right? Because the pastor and the board are coming together to make an idea and then they're bringing it to the body. I think our nation could take an example of that and say, you know what? We've got this higher president and then we've got the Senate and the House and blah, blah, blah. You know, maybe we need to come up with these ideas and we need to take it to the people of America. <laughs> but we just have to let it get so removed. Right, we have. We have. I mean, when our children decide that they want to move on from high school to go to college or to go into the military or to go into the work field, you know what? We want to help them with that decision, do we not? We want to make sure that they aren't making the same mistakes that we made when we were younger. We want to help them be better at what they desire to do for the rest of their life. So it's about coming together and making and planning and then seeing that the success of the plan is falling through. Having someone on your side during these times ensures that they are looking out for your best interest, for their best interest, and not the interest of their own. Or of the place that they're working. The psalmist says there is safety. We see here it is not only safety but comfort as well. When we work together. When we come together as one. Making a decision when you, are, or you only have one and there's others not in that decision. You're looking to fail. It'll fail. I can't make a personal decision for this community if nobody else knows what that personal decision is. And then, I, and then it'll just fail, and then I'll be feeling bad because, you know what, I tried to do something for a people that didn't really want anything done for them. Right? That's how things get started, and that's how things die. <laughs> A good Christian friend, a good Christian family provides that sounding board to make sure safety and comfort are considered. There's an old cliche that says, failure to plan is planning to fail. Amen? Second one, a good hand to land in a fall. Our primary scripture passage for this message was Ecclesiastes 4.9. 
Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Ecclesiastes 4, 9. So, so far, we've been discussing verse 9 of the, those two passages. But in the second passage, verse 10, we see if they fall, we see that the, they use the plural word they. The author Solomon tells us that they are falling or failing together. Right? But, but watch what happens here. Which, you know, when you think about it, it tells us that the true friend does not desert their good friend when things get rough. When, when you know, when the ceiling's falling down in on them, they don't quit each other. Imagine that. They, they see it through. Imagine that. They don't jump ship when the water is a little rough. Right? Uh, They don't run out and quit just because times are tough. They stick it through. You know, I talked last week, weekend about, you know, it's just around the corner. There's something different coming. You might have to walk a little bit further. You might have to travel a little bit further. You might have to look a little bit ahead of you. But there's something different coming. There's something better along the way. There's something that's going to change your life. You just got to hold in, hold out, hold on. Don't let fear ruin an opportunity. Two are better than one in work and success. But there will not always be success. You got to accept that, right? I mean, but we're to learn from our failures, are we not? That's what brings true success. There will be tough times, and those times are when a friend will be needed most. During tough times, as our passage indicates, both may fail together, but it says also, the one will lift up his fellow. Although you both might fall, it's easier to say, you know what? I know we're feeling weak, but let's get up and keep going. Right? It reminds me of the acrostic, the acrostic team, the word team, which is together, everyone achieves more. Together, everyone achieves more. Team. There's no I in team, right? You've heard, if you have ever played sports, you've heard your coach say that. There is no I in team. You might have a valuable player, You might be the the MVP of the team, but that doesn't mean you're the one that did it all by yourself. Right? It takes the whole team. It takes everyone to achieve success. You can't achieve anything when you are lying down on the ground after a fall. Anytime I feel weak, after uh, doing a job or during a job, I literally can hear my drill sergeant yelling, head up, chest out, move forward. I think God would be saying the same thing to us, right? Come on, my child, head up, chest out, move forward. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't stop. Because when you stop, you're dead. Right? You're done. That's it. End of the road. You don't know what you can achieve if you just keep working through it. If you just keep moving through it. If you just keep going. Just keep going and going like the Energizer Bunny. Right? Just keep going and going and going. Whatever the reason for the fall, it's, it's just tough to recover though. You know, there's been plenty of times in my life where I just wanted to lay down and I just wanted to give it up. I, I'm done. You know? And I'm going to tell you the truth. I'll tell you the truth right now. In ministry, there's been a lot of those times. 
There, there's been a lot of those times where it's like, I'm ready to just throw in the towel because it doesn't seem like anybody really is listening or even gives a hoot. Right? I mean, you plan to do something and nobody shows up. That kind of hurts a little bit. It kind of strikes you deep a little bit. It kind of mars you a little bit. It kind of makes you wonder, what am I doing wrong, God? Come on. Remember that when you're looking at the hand of that best friend, as he or she is sticking it out to help you up, grab it and trust them. Amen? I mean, for me personally, I can hang on to God's hand. Okay? I can, I can reach up and, and grab God's hand, and I can hang on to God's hand with all my might. But I have the tendency to let go. Right? But now, let's switch that role. If God is hanging on to my hand, do you think he has a tendency to let go? No. God has a firm grip. God has a good grip. God's got this. And when we allow ourselves to be handed over to God, when we allow God's hand to hold us, no matter the circumstance, no matter the situation, God's got this. He's got your six. He's got your back. He already knows what's going to happen. We just got to trust him. We got to trust his ways. We got to trust his time. We got to trust his love. We got to trust his life. We just got to give ourselves over to that situation and say, Father God, you've got to handle it because I can't because I want to let go of it. <laughs> Let's do a re recap here real quick. Ecclesiastes 4 9, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Two are better than one because that is God's design. He didn't just make Adam and leave Adam, right? He made a helpmate. That's what it says in the Bible. It says, This man's God knew, you know, God knew I created a man. He's going to need some help. I better, I, better, I better make a woman, you know, someone smart and pretty <laughs> that he'll be attracted to because, you know what, <laughs> he's a man. <laughs> he, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed, right? I'm sure Adam was, you know, he knew everything. But that's the way God designed things. He designed them in twos. I mean, when the animals were aborting the, the Noah's Ark, they didn't go in one. It said they went in by twos. Why? Why did they go in by twos? Why do we have twos? Because when two or more are gathered, the Bible says, there I am. Right? And when we have more than one, well, we know we have something. We know that it's going to be more later on. Two are better than one because that is God's design. God is three in one. And we should learn a lesson from the Trinity. I mean, God, God talks to his son and they all talk to the Holy Spirit. We got to believe that. The last part of that verse, it says, but woe to him that is alone. I implore you to reach, reach out for God today, right? You're not alone. You know, we might look alone, right? But, but you run with God, don't you? Right? Terry, you run with God, you know, you might just be one person. You might not have a significant other in your life, but you know what? You're not alone. We're never alone. We are never, ever alone. When I was a kid and I was going through all the, the physical and mental abuse that was being handed down to me, 
I was never alone in those times. When I ran away from home, where did I run away to? I ran away to a church. Why? Because the Holy Spirit knew and was, was telling me where to go. Because I was never alone then. Never have been alone. None of us have ever been alone. If we look back at our past, we might be doing things all by ourselves, but we are never, ever alone. Look at the certain circumstances in your life. How many times has your life been spared from a certain circumstance or a situation that you could have been involved in, but God intervened in such a way that your life was spared? Oh, there might be some pain and some tragedy. You might have some scars and some issues, but you, you weren't alone in the, in the circumstance. And you're not alone today. We often tell people if they have, you know, if they're, if they're falling in love with someone and, and they really want that to be the person, they need to seek God's heart first. Because if that person's chasing God's heart and you're chasing God's heart, God's going to bring your hearts together. Amen? And if, if we desire a relationship a true friend relationship in our life, we need to be praying about that. We need to be seeking God's counsel on that. God, bring about the right person that is going to come into my life that I know I can count on, that can be there, Father God, when I need them to be there, that I can talk to, Father God, that I can tell them all my woes, and they just don't hear me whining and complaining. But, Father God, they actually hear what is going on in my life. And, Father God, they say, you know what? I hear what you're saying. Let's go to God with that. Right? Seeking godly counsel for our lives and the lives that we want to be involved in. I think that's exactly where God desires each and every one of us to be today. I know we're not there yet, church. But we can, we can get there. We can get a little closer day by day, can't we? Right, church? Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now in your glorious name. Thank you, Lord, for your words of encouragement and the message that you bring. We're not alone, Father God. We are here amongst family, Father. And Lord, we ask that you would bless them. Lord, wherever they go, whatever they are doing today, whatever the plan is, Father God, for them, let it be glorified in your majesty, Father. Let the light shine where it needs to shine in your life and in through their lives, Father God, into the lives that they come in contact with, Father. We thank you, Father, for every opportunity that you put us in, that you place us at, Father God, where we can touch lives in such a way, Father God, that it springs forward into yours. Maybe some people just need to fall into yours, <laughs> right? I, I would much rather fall into the hands of Christ than to be swayed by the world or society. Lord, you know these, these times that we are living in, these terrible, terrible times. I, I know people have been saying that for thousands of years, terrible, terrible times. But these are really terrible times, Father God. We're still blessed beyond measure. We are. Don't hear me on the gloom and doom side. We are blessed beyond measure. We are blessed beyond recognition. We are blessed, be Father God, because you have blessed our lives. We are still free, Father God, to preach and teach, to go and talk, Father God, to live our lives. Father God, we are still free to be able to do that, Lord. And Father, help us all to recognize, help everyone to recognize those freedoms, Father. Lord, we thank you. We ask that you would bless, bless, bless. All of those who are traveling or are not here, Father God, we ask that you bless them. All of those who need healing in their life right now, Father God, physical or mental, whatever it is, Father God, we ask that you heal them, Father God. We ask, Lord, that you would be with them, Father. Be with their situations that they're in, Lord. Lord, I, I ask that you would be with Dick, Father God. Whatever he's doing, wherever he's at, whatever he's going through, Father God, be with Dick. Father, be with Angel and, T and Tyler, Father God. Whatever they are doing, wherever they are at, Father God, bless their lives, Father God. Be with them. 
Father, the Wooten family. Lord, I, I pray for them right now, Father God, and I lift them up. The Gebby family, Father God, I lift them up, and I, we pray for them, Father God. Lord, be with these people, Father. Continue to be with Walt. Healing. Be with Randy. Healing. Take away that lonely heart, Father. Be with Byron, Father God. Continue to strengthen him and, and increase his, his health, Father. Gosh, Be with the Heinle family, Father God. Be with the situations that they're going through and that they're involved in, Father. Lord, healing in Alex. Healing in Kyle, Father God. Healing in Keisha, Lord. Healing in Bailey, Father God. Lord, be with all of them, Lord. Be with each and every one of their children, Father. Be with their their family. Be with their parents, Father God. May they come to a recognition, Father God, a reconciliation, Father God, that they need you in their life. That their parents would realize that they need Christ. That Marty's brother would realize that he needs Christ. Father, we speak to all of these things, Lord. Father, we ask blessings, blessings, Father. Be with Jerry as he's spending time with his friend, Father. Bless their time together. May they be safe. Father, we ask that you would be with us, Lord. Be with us, guiding and guarding our lives, Lord, as we go through these days, as we go through this time. Help lift us up and strengthen us. Help build our confidence so we can continue to be spiritually bold for those who need us. Lord, thank you for my friends, and I thank you for my family, Father. Lord, all of them are a blessing. Take us from this place today, Father God. In Jesus' mighty name we say, amen. Hey, if you don't hear it anywhere else, you're going to hear it right here. God loves you and amen. She is. Praise God.